Good morning. My name is uh, Makesh Rao uh, from Cisco Systems, a small company based out of San Jose, California. <laughs> Very tiny one. Um, I'm an IT architect. Um, my background is primarily in integration. I know what is the integration guy doing here is what you're thinking. I started my life as a B2B uh, architect in Cisco Systems, working on all of the B2B integrations with our uh, customers and partners. And um, I've been involved in some standard bodies, uh, worked for uh, a technical committee that worked on a standard called AS4, uh, another alphabet soup in OSS. Um, I was a uh, co-chair uh, for the specification and then made a switch to security around, I think, four years ago. Uh, so relatively new compared to all you guys in the room. And uh, here I am. Um, I'm responsible for the, the IAM platform that Christina and Josh just sort of introduced. All right. I'm Satosh Sinha. Uh, I'm a specialist with KPMG, and uh, we help uh, to evaluate, uh, strategize, design, build IMG and access management solutions. So um, I, have, I have experience in, in cloud architecture as well as IMG and access management, and we help uh, Cisco uh, collaborate with Cisco uh, build the platform here. So if you think about the technical technical pillar, <laughs> oh yeah. <laughs> All right. So if you, if you talk about uh, the technical pillars of customer IAM, the reason we, we have wanted to have this conversation with you guys was um, in the previous CIS sessions, we talked about the standards, we talked about uh, the use cases, but we never talked about uh, the pillars, the, the platform built out of IMGT management. And I think it, it's difficult to build an IMGT management plat platform ground up in the sense that the capabilities that actually make an IAM system. So we wanted to cover that. Uh, so uh, a couple of aspects of the deck, I think if you think about it, uh, the way we wanted to unfold is basically where we come from, what our business needs from us, and then the second part of it that we want to go through is um, how we thought through the process of designing the system and building the principles around it. Uh, we want to unfold the architecture we built out uh, in a very lightweight, high level way so that you can take a look at it, what we did, and then provide that uh, socialize our architecture with the team here because I believe that there are significant IAM experience team here. They can take a look at it and see what we have done. And the last of, uh, we'll quickly go into lessons learned and see what we learned from the experience in building the platform. Uh, overall, I think it's, if you think about it, IAM, I think it's like the standards that we talk about are like the recipe, in, the, in the recipe of cooking, uh, the three course meal, there are ingredients in it. And typically what happens is when you pick up the standards, it really becomes difficult uh, saying that how do we pick it and how do we build a solution, pitch a solution, or, or make this recipe. I think part of those journeys is actually very critical to talk to the forum here and get a feedback around it, and then and move on uh, to, to just some aspects of our architecture. That's, that's the key aspect of it. And talking of recipes and ingredients making me hungry. <laughs> but uh, all right. Long as the clicker, okay, thank you. So a um, little bit about Cisco, just to give you a sense of the complexity that you guys are trying to address. Uh, like I said, it's, uh, it started off primarily in the, in the hardware business. Um, we built routers and switches. And to borrow what uh, Nasrin said this morning, uh, if any of your devices are online, it's probably hitting one of the Cisco access points or uh, it's connecting through uh, to the backbone to one of the Cisco routers. So we are traditionally considered the, the plumbers of the internet, uh, but over the years we've had some organic and inorganic growth uh, to about 200 acquisitions, and we are slowly sort of making that move into the, uh, the software and the SaaS business. So the 200 acquisitions that we've had and some of the uh, in-house products that we have built have all had their own IAM solutions. They all come with their own IAM solutions, their own CRM solutions, uh, you know, their own customer uh, master metadata. So what that, uh, introduces is a problem in terms of a siloed experience for the customers and partners that interact with all of these products. So they have to have multiple identities uh, as they interact with these products. They have to go to multiple uh, you know, support uh, tools to open uh, support tickets and talk to multiple teams as they, they expect service uh, out of Cisco. And that not only is a, is a problem for the customers, but is also a problem for the, the sales and service support model that Cisco has. We are not able to sort of give a unified uh, experience to the to the customer in terms of their entire journey uh, from from sales to to support. So the solution that we came up with within uh, IT is really to come up with that uh, that experience, that common experience that we spoke about across all of these functions. Uh, you know, sales, uh, support, and service. 
so the, the intent was to come up with a platform, an identity and access management platform uh, that the customers can use and they can sort of have that one unified identity, uh, just like a Google or an Apple ID that we are all so used to. We wanted that Cisco ID for our customers and partners as they interact with us. And we wanted to have that uh, in a multi-tenant fashion. Um, you know, Christina spoke about the, the uh, relationship we have with our partners. That's traditionally been how Cisco's you know, sales uh, you know, pushes. So the multi-tenant aspect was important for us to be able to give back uh, to the customers and partners, control over their, uh, over their data, over their users, uh, because we have always been in a very high touch model. So we, we take care of customers and partners. They're used to picking up the phone and calling us and expecting support. We wanted to slowly have that transferred over to them so that they are able to better manage their users and, and, uh, and the devices that they own. So a couple of things that I will actually quickly add here, uh, the 200 brands or products that we talk about, they're re really significant brands. If they think about it, Cisco web brand by itself. Uh, a lot of the SaaS companies that we talk about, they are brand by themselves. They have been acquired because they have significant, significant brand. They were running as a product and they can individually stand as their own company, actually. Their revenue sizes, their team sizes, the product diversity that we talk about, it's really, it's a very diverse organization. So when I started my first conversation with Christina and the team, I was thought it, it got to be a little simpler than this because I thought I have seen quite a bit of IAM solutions. The kind of diversity that I saw here was quite significant. And that's that's very key part of the how we framed our thought process behind it because uh, for us, identity management is a product, is an implicit product, and then we are building it for the product, which are all significantly large products that we talk about. And that's that's a kind of key conversation that we want to have here. The second part of it is, um, it's just the nature of the inline security to all these businesses that made us very thoughtful about the decisions and the build out of the architecture that we talked about. And I think that's what we'll go through the next pieces of it. So to so tackle some of the complexity that Santosh spoke about, uh, we, we started the journey about two years ago, uh, spent a lot of time strategizing in terms of how to go about this, this journey. And we were lucky to have uh, you know, some of the BU leaders participate with us, some of the architects that have been very active in the standards body. In fact, uh, one of them is a, is a co-author of the SKIM um, uh, spec. So we were, we were lucky to have such thought leaders as part of our team. We had uh, participation from InfoSec. So together we came up, came up with a set of guardrails, uh, guiding principles, uh, so that we can sort of attack the, the problem that we have at hand. And some of the ones that we, have, we, we thought were uh, relevant for this conversation, for an IAM conversation, is what we'll probably sort of uh, go into. So the first one was definitely the, the experience. Uh, like I spoke about, we wanted that common Cisco experience for our customers and partners. And, and to do that, we wanted to come up with an IAM platform and give that one user identity that they can start using. But at the same time, we didn't want to take the control away from some of the acquisitions, some of the products that we had, because each one of them in their own right are brands in themselves. So they are known by their own names, uh, not necessarily attached to Cisco, and we didn't want to take that away from them immediately. So we wanted to give them the flexibility to have to, to run their business because they know it best, they know their customers best, and we, we wanted to give them that flexibility. So we, we wanted a principle that gave them enough flexibility, but give, gave us enough control so that we gave that experience to the, the end users. So, so guiding principles for us, it's so critical for us because a lot of times what happens, we build IAM platform or platform, customer ID platform. There are a lot of decisions that we take and a lot of compromises we make through the journey of, of building the platform. At some point of time, the team has to be accountable to something. Something has to be checked off or crossed to say that I took this decision. So these guiding principles actually, th there is a bigger set of guiding principles for us. We thought this six were relevant for the conversation that we have. But at some point of time, this was, uh, if you choose a platform, if you choose a product, if you choose a uh, capability, if you choose a technology uh, pattern, everything has to be um, rationalized to some, rational, some decision making process. And these principles were the principles that actually helped us make the streamline the process. We can go to a room, whiteboard, argue, discuss about it, at some point and bring it to closure. And these were the principles that brought it to closure for us. So, so some of the things that we talk about is zero downtime architecture. If you think about it, all these products that we talk about, they're very cloud native in nature, right? In the sense that, you know, uh, I am, if you think about I am is monolithic systems, the way I, I came up with, and then the cloud architecture, the Netflixes of the world, the cloud companies, they said zero downtime, number of 
releases per day and those kind of things, right? So in 2014, I started this journey. I thought, oh my God, this is, this is very counterintuitive to what I have done before. Marrying them together had, had make it really challenging for us. And identity, as I said about the vendor landscape, is, is just not there yet in terms of uh, we always played this caught up game saying that, you know, I'm catching up with my products, I'm catching up with my, my product team, and they always keep over saying that, you know what, ING does not understand the change of tide. They don't understand business well. They are not fast enough. And then they don't understand how sensitive we are to the downtime. So because they think that their platform is a castle, and we, they don't want to have us walk through this ING management system. So part of it is, it is actually assurance for us because we can run, otherwise we'll keep up late in the night is basically a zero downtime architecture, an uh, architecture that can deal with failures. Uh, this failure for us defined as uh, a technical replication failure, or failure defined as a security failure, right? The both failures are, are, are consideration for us. The second part of it is the change appetite. Uh, basically, if we don't have a zero time architecture, we don't have time to experiment, we don't have time to change. So it becomes so critical for us. Any product that we bought, if we did not fit into this thing, we would say no, we don't want the product. That's, that's as simple as that. If you don't want to work with us to build this capability, we are not going with you. So that's, that's zero time time architecture for you. The ability to run, operate, manage, change in a real way, right? Uh, without any, any downtime experience. The second thing that we talk about was design for integrations. I think what if, if, you, if you think about it, uh, UI is where we struggle. Uh, integrations is where we struggle. The struggle is not about building a platform. I think the struggle is the measure of success for IAM is the kind of integrations that you go through. If you don't have integrations, you can have 15 integration and rock solid platform, it's, it's of no business value, right? So the design for integration is a very important part of it. And, and the, the product teams are really picky in the same the sense that, you know, they want this little thing on the right hand side, a circle on the top, and, and experience has to be very nuanced in, in all the conversation that we talk about. And for them, we said, you know, we are not in business of building product, right? At some point of time, we have to build it in a way that it's integratable. It's integratable, they can own it, they can integrate it. We provide a set of mechanisms for them. So if it is not integratable, it's not a choice for us. Basically, that's how we thought about it. So, so all these things in the sense that how we tie back to a technical architecture is something that we'll get into in, 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 a, in a little bit. Secure by default for, for us, if you think about it, there's another aspect to it. A lot of people say that we align to InfoSec policies and we are done. Information security gave our XYZ policies and we'll go by it. But I think about it, the pyramid identity being a new perimeter. A lot of IM guys are not security guys, traditionally. They come into security, they understand security, but then IM is slightly second degree to cyber, but they got into cyber piece of it. If you think about that, there's one of the things that secure by default. If you're making this as a perimeter security, the first thing that you have to think about is why, how can we take it notch up? Because InfoSec is good enough for the rest of the applications. If I am the gateway to your internet brands, I need to make sure that we are up notch. So we have the necessary armor to, to protect the enterprise and we have the capability to secure. So our secure by default is slightly higher than InfoSec requirement of Cisco. We went beyond what they needed for it and that's very specific need for us because at this point of time, um, if, if identity being the perimeter is defeated, everything else is defeated. So we had something like a paranoid computing that got, got into it. That's a key aspect of, of, of making sure. So uh, if you choose a database, if you choose a database that doesn't support encryption, if you choose something that doesn't support encryption technologies or uh, short leave tokens, rotation, um, pooling based to rota token rotations, it's not a choice for us. So that's something that we talked about. So. So Cisco, being a global uh, company, we, we do business in a lot of companies, uh, countries obviously. So we have to abide by the laws that govern those countries and regions. So what Cisco has done is they have a standard, uh, sort of a central privacy organization that works with our legal. And they look at all of the various laws across the globe and what they do is they distill it for us. Uh, and that's what we call as a Cisco policy. And we wanted to make sure that the platform that we build uh, is, is conformant to that. So the, the, if we are conformant to the Cisco policy, then we are sure that we'll be conformant to all of the uh, various laws across the, uh, the globe. So that's why we wanted to make sure that it's privacy by design. We, make, uh, we take care of all of these laws and GDPR being one of the most common ones is also baked into it. And Christina touched to it, some of the technical decisions we took in terms of making sure the data is compliant is also part of the same uh, guiding principles. 
and and we have been uh, you know most of our our sales is through our channel partners so and like i said we have been a high touch company uh, we give them a lot of uh, support uh, in terms of just them picking up the phone and calling us now we want to make sure that we hand it back to them and we want to uh, make sure that we they have a very clear space in which they can manage their own entities apply their own security policies and manage their users in that space and that's why multi tenancy was a very very important concept for us and that's why the platform is essentially called organization centric um, so one of the things that we we'll add here organization centric a lot of times i hear about persona i want to basically identify users across personas and this kind of thing uh, if you think about it iam has evolved from two party conversations to a three party conversation we talk about i would talk to my customer and that's the end of it and that's how we design systems previously i think the important construct that has changed is i identity management is three party construct one is the 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 third party which can be the suppliers to the service or uh, partners in the conversation the customer itself in the conversation and the organization it's it's a very three party organization so i i somehow believe that uh, from the identity perspective we had we took we took a lot of time to make the decision about organization centric and make it multi tenant software because uh, really do we need a multi tenant software was a conversation that we had and i think uh, some part of it is, is the appreciation towards the three party conversation because to give a real context if you go to amazon if you are retaining a product you don't really care whether it's a jack and jill taking your call you really care that amazon is hosting someone there to take my call and returning my product right so so that's a very fundamental change that's actually most complex uh, uh, guiding principle that we had that actually did a lot of engineering work for us to make that three party model by default or working on behalf of operating on behalf of working for a customer making customer making uh, making our partners accountable for the security risks on their plate rather than just giving the blind trust is something that we talked about so the zero trust architecture now third parties are integral part of our onboarding process but then there is a lot of delegation that goes to third party they can manage their own population but then if something wrong happens they are accountable to sir because they have a contractual obligation with cisco so that's a very important construct for us to talk about so so quickly going through the technical mapping and how we define the enablers for each of them yeah so i think uh, what we want to do here is really speak about some of the technology um, uh, choices that we made um, and and how it applies to the guiding principle so the first one obviously being the the uh, experience and we have sort of two aspects to that when we say experience one is obviously the ui which is the most visible and the one that the user actually interacts with and for the ui we wanted to make sure that we give enough control back to the the uh, the product so that they can brand it in their way they can have control over it at the same time embedding our our processes as part of their uh, workflow so we came up with a uh, web sdk for them uh, web sdk is essentially a set of javascript uh, apis that we have and we we uh, we have it uh, for them to start using it so they can start building their ui and make api calls back into our platform to be able to do the uh, you know the validations that are necessary to do that we we obviously had to be api native for the web sdk to use those uh, apis we had to build the platform uh, api first and in fact our ui uh, ended up being the first clients of these apis and we wanted to do that so that the the uh, integrators the products as well as customers and partners both are able to integrate with us and uh, take advantage of these apis instead of coming to our ui and and going through our workflow which is which could be very static we definitely wanted to leverage open standards again because of the multiple integrations that we have one on our product side the multiple 200 products that we have to integrate with as well as the customers and partners on the other side so we wanted to make sure that we stick to standards and this coming from a b2b background just made sense to do that uh, you know having gone through the edis and and uh, rosetta net of b2b standards just made sense for us to keep that simple so that it's easier for them to do it the other aspect being these customers and partners not they don't do business only with cisco right so it just makes it easy for them to have a standard to follow so that it's repeatable even on their side with the other uh, you know organizations that they do business with in terms of the data um, just so that we have the flexibility for the products to uh, you know use our platform we chose a very flexible uh, json data model um, there is governance around it uh, but we we try to keep it as as sort of open as possible so that we can we can start to take some of the um, the requirements from them in terms of adding that one unique attribute that they want to store for their user as part of the overall data model so design for integration if you think about it a uh, lot of sail point implementation um, we integrate with with the saas providers and we are we 
on the connector side, this is one side of it. So if you think about it, we are other side of the connector, uh, that's what it is. So very important concept for us design for integration, the three aspects of design for integration, we need to think about design for integration for the product, we need to think about design for integration for the partners, and we need to think about design for integration for our customers. Because a lot of times what happens here is we are part of an access request approval process for a customer on their enterprise. So that's what it is. So making sure that we understand those aspects of it. For the products, we thought of Web SDK was the way because they can add a webhook to our process. They can in, you know, take a callback uh, for our process. The second part of it is being API native. All these products are API. They have to, they are microservices as well. So for them, making an identity API call is much simpler than not doing doing some of the replication architectures and those kind of things. So API native was an important concept for them. API native is an important concept for our customers so that they can provide a seamless enterprise experience for our customers. API native is an important concept for our devices so that they can run, operate uh, on edge compute device. API native was so important for our um, partners so that they can layer uh, services on top of Cisco products. So all those things are a very critical part of being the API native solution. So ultimately we thought about it saying that even we consume our own API. The web SDKs are the consumers of our API. Our APIs are, are all out there in the identity construct uh, on the internet. Open standards for us is very important uh, for integration as well. We do not educate people. Developer forum has been important. The, uh, the OAuth has been, we saw that amazing amount of conversant OAuth people uh, who understand OAuth really well, skim really well. So why to re-engineer stuff? So we, we leverage our solution across four standards. So YDC, we leverage our solution across OAuth, we leverage our solution across skim, and then we said that's what we support and that's what we've done. If you want to integrate, it, it, that's what it is. REST and HTTP, it's very native solution that we talk about. And the multi-version platform, here, here is the part of it. It's basically orchestrating the solution across 200 odd products, uh, half, a million pop, half a million partners. We're talking about eight million plus customers. It's a very amazing difficult. I can say that you know the change management itself becomes so difficult. And I think this is a very important part of our architecture is we support multiple versions of our APIs across a, a very static data model. So the, the construct here is uh, we took some compromises on the design agility of data model to support a uh, multi-version platform in the sense that I cannot be very aggressive about data model changes, but I can be saying that, you know, your version 1.1, 2, 2.1, 3, I can run 1 and 2 together. I can run 1.1 and 2 together, but then um, we have to be really strategic about the stateful nature of the architecture that we saw, the stateful data model that we support. So um, that's one aspect of it. Uh, zero downtime architecture, we, we went um, cloud native. Uh, we went to the vendors, whether they can support cloud native, and I think we were really surprised that they haven't caught up on that. Um, the, but the cloud native architecture of it is basically, um, if you think about cloud native, it's been talked about in a very different way. What is cloud native is a very vague term for us, but us, uh, cloud native is basically automatable build, ship, and run. Uh, build, ship, and run in the sense that uh, mature CI, CD pipeline, ability to run, deploy software within like say 15, 10, 15 minutes after a code push. Uh, ability to basically uh, understand the failures, basically being the telemetry of it, saying that, you know, I'm healthy, I'm up and running, I've taken, re take the request, and the service discovery aspects of it. And the third aspect of it of cloud native architecture that we talk about here is, is just being able to um, convey, saying that, you know, uh, I am I'm declarative about how I behave and how I operate. So that's something that we talk about. API native solution that we talk about here is just being uh, able to um, able to consume uh, network, storage, uh, disk, uh, com compute, everything through APIs is very important construct. PaaS, for us, PaaS was uh, a layer of abstraction. We understand that, you know, uh, uh, PaaS provides a, a standard way of automating uh, platform as a service uh, of orchestration, running in multiple clouds, and those kind of things. So being a zero downtime, I can run it anywhere, it still looks very standard for us. PaaS was a very critical solution for us. And again, the multi-version platform that we talked about. Secure by default, uh, we had APIs for security as well, crypto APIs, token APIs, token rotation APIs, we had APIs for secrets management, we had APIs for everything. So we have a posture where we don't have any, any credential for more than five minutes. We, we rotate, uh, we lose, use our short lease certificates across the architecture. Um, we use uh, security APIs, which actually abstracts our developers about writing security, just being invoking APIs, and that's important concept of it. 
The second thing, the PaaS provides you a lot of security controls at the PaaS layer itself. So instead of designing the solution and being the controls, we said that you know, let's enforce the security at the PaaS layer and the developers just write code for the business value of it. They are totally transparent. So PaaS came a long way. It was a heated discussion across the team. PaaS was not, a lot of databases are not, not ready for the PaaS, but we are PaaS for state and stateless services. We run PaaS uh, in a very comprehensive way. Secure by default, uh, we didn't want to open up loopholes. Open standards have been thought through about security vulnerabilities. So why not just use open standards for, for everything in the, in the security areas? Uh, uh, very scratch from the way you create token, the way you crypto, everything has been uh, open standards by default. And multi-tenant for us, it was a very, very, for us it was so, uh, it will be very uh, uh, embarrassing to say that, you know, a customer X C X customer Y's data. So instead of making uh, multi-tenant as an authorization function, what we did was uh, we made it tenant aware. So your authentication happens at, this, at a tenant, your session you manage as a, ten as a tenant, your whole, whole authorization happens within the context of a tenant. So tenant is a wrapping uh, layer rather than the authorization just being a function of it. It was a very um, nuanced decision. Uh, we took a lot of engineering effort, effort to basically give the baseline URL for each of the customer, but then everything within it is, is like a SaaS, totally transparent, logically separated uh, across customers. Yes. So the red light is flashing at me very aggressively. So <laughs> I'm going to quickly skim through the next two uh, points so that uh, we can hand it off to the next speakers. So privacy by design, again, token exchange was very, very important for us. Uh, the way we wanted to look at this is uh, when, a, when a partner comes in and, and they want to manage their customer's uh, tenancy, you wanted them to come and exchange their token for the customer's token so that they can go in with the privileges that are applicable for the, the customer's tenancy and, and they don't have any elevated privileges when they come into the platform. Pass again was important for us to be able to uh, you know, deploy uh, in the, into multiple clouds and be, deploy, be deployable uh, in, a, in, a, in a very rapid fashion. So we have completely uh, made infrastructure as a code. So we have uh, scripts that we can use to uh, quickly stand up the, uh, the platform. And again, multi-cloud, which I touched about, uh, goes hand in hand there. We, we wanted to be completely cloud native and be deployed uh, in, in public and private clouds. Right now we are in, in Cisco hosted private clouds, but then the architecture is, is open enough to be used in a public cloud also. Open standards uh, was very important for us to be able to uh, you know, give the, the solution back into the, the uh, customers and partners. And multi-tenancy, again, is, is an important aspect so that, like Santosh said, customer A does not see customer B's data and vice versa. Organization-centric, um, essentially giving back the control to the partners um, so that they can have a self-service way of managing their own security policies and, and, and their users. API native was very important, so if they if they want to build uh, an application on their side to manage all of this, they are free to do so. They don't have to necessarily come over and use our, our UI. Multi-tenancy, again, the, the uh, you know, the control of each tenant only looking at their data and their users and being able to provision it only within their tenancy. Uh, open standards, again, the ease of integration that we spoke about and, and token exchange so that we don't have any elevated privileges as, as uh, customers go into, or partners go into managing their customers. So a quick readout, if the zero downtime architecture, if you think of a horizontal response across like five capabilities, but then the most important capability that, technical capability that we talk about is open standards, like response across like seven. But overall, this actually gives us where we spot ourselves, a very macro view towards how our principles match the technology and, and how we build upon it. Quick, quick view of the architecture. Um, if you see uh, that left-hand side, the blue boxes that you see are all operating capabilities. And then on the right-hand side is what we call about identity. Our identity is like 50 microservices. Um, with some of the stateful services on the right, we haven't done the, the solution of that better, but that's, that's what it is about. Quick read out where we are with respect to our our capabilities. Yeah, we wanted to spend some more time here, but uh, if you look at it, I think standards and pass are area where we are comfortable and we are confident that we have done a good job. Obviously, multi-cloud is an area where we, we have to start the journey. We have not yet started the journey. Uh, hopefully, by the second half of this year, we'll, we'll get there. And some of the other ones like API native, JSON data model are all work in progress, and that's why they sort of show up as, as yellow or red. Um, I think token, token exchange is another draft specification that we have implemented, uh, our own impl our interpretation of it, uh, but that uh, that's something that works for our model, which is a B2B2C model. Um, so I think uh, this is pretty much where we are in terms of the, the technology enablers and how they apply to the, the uh, guiding principles. So 
close. I if you have questions, I can take off. Yeah, we'll, we'll be around here. Um, sorry we ran over time, but thank you for your uh, time and being here. <laughs>